from the classic image of the necromancer Faust to the sorcerers on the silver screen or the pattern image of the magicians of role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, the Book of Magic, the Book of Shadows, filled with incantations, symbols, and strange diagrams, is simply part of the image and arsenal of the wielder of magic. But what do we know about real, historical books of magic? You may be surprised to learn that, despite official condemnation and just the accident of history, many such books actually survive. 22 such texts in England alone, just to name a few. In this episode, I want to explore the innocuously titled Cambridge University Library Manuscript Additional 3544, a textbook of necromancy which includes a range of spells, including a predominance of erotic binding magic, divination, natural magic, and a primer on necromantic practice more generally. Such a text, self-consciously produced to both magically arm its user, but also with an eye toward its own aesthetic value as magical in itself, is an important glimpse into the real historical practice of magic in the late Middle Ages. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, or Kabbalah, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics in esotericism. And also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube for free, I'd hope you consider supporting my work on Patreon or with a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and I really appreciate your considering supporting the channel. But now, let's turn to the 91 experimenta, as the text calls them, of a necromancer manual found in the Cambridge Library. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. While the Middle Ages are sometimes thought to be the burning times where magical texts, along with their practitioners, were subjected to the inquisitional fires of the auto de fe, a surprising collection of such texts do in fact survive from pre-modernity. However, because of academic bias, it's only in recent times that such texts have been given proper analysis and modern addition a welcomed change to the dismissal of such volumes as mere gothic superstition. The scholar Francis Young has produced just such a study and edition in his publication of Additional 3544, though other numerous such necromantic works remain unpublished. In fact, I'll be leaning pretty heavily on his really careful analysis as we explore this wonderful historical example of necromantic sorcery. Now, before going forward, I know that there's some purists out there who are going to say that necromancy only means divination via the dead. And frankly, that never happens in additional 3544 and many medieval necromantic manuals. By the Middle Ages, the term necromancy had just become a catch-all to mean basically magic with a sort of dark tint typically involving the conjuring and binding of spirits, both good and evil. So just like any word, words change over time, and the strict idea of necromancy as summoning a spirit to tell the future or resurrecting a dead person, simply not always what necromancy means by the Middle Ages. So keeping that in mind, let's talk about the material cultural aspect of additional 3544. Simply put, the volume is a small, it's only 19 by 14 and a half centimeter, it's a manuscript written in paper containing 91 magical experiments, probably produced between 1536 and 1539. This small size, as you can probably imagine, probably has to do with the desire to, I'll hide this book in a pinch, 
and the dates are based on internal evidence from the text itself. Specifically, there are other references to other printed works which give a pretty early range for the earliest part that the text could have been produced, and there are additional references to religious practices important to the magical operations which have, would have come to an end in the 1540s for reasons that we'll talk about in a minute, thus giving us a pretty good idea for narrowing down the date of the production of the manuscript and the ideas in it itself. Now this period of time is rather interesting both in the history of magic generally, but also the specific political and religious context of England at the time, that is to say the convulsions brought on by the Reformation of Henry VIII, specifically the dissolution of the monasteries, the dispersal of the monks, and of course their libraries. Thus, it's worth pointing out that such a text of ritual magic, especially given those rituals are so strongly tied to Catholicism, would have made this volume doubly dangerous. Not only is the text religiously prohibited, because it's necromancy, but the rituals themselves would have been perceived as an endorsement of the very religious practices that the Reformation wanted to sweep away. Further, magical practice in general at this time was thought to be pretty clearly and often tied directly to politics, with virtually all major sorcery trials at this time, not counting the witch trials, that's a whole different matter, they were all explicitly political in nature. That is, using magic to harm members of the court or the monarch themselves. So here, in this text, we have a genuinely dangerous idea at the time for both religious, cultural, and political reasons. So who composed additional 3544? Well, what's interesting is that the author has carefully produced this text, both in terms of its rather systematic contents, but also in the aesthetic of the text, which is both clearly trying to look professionally magical, something not totally uncommon in 16th century magical texts, but even the text employed or a choice by the writer to make the script look older and perhaps more arcane. Unlike such volumes from a century prior, like the Munich Necromancer's Manual or CLM 849, it's unlikely that this text was composed by a Catholic priest, though it's possible, maybe even likely, that some outer lower level cleric or perhaps a former monk or friar is responsible for the composition of the manuscript. The name Paul Foreman is written in the same hand as the English sections of the Experimenta. The volume has sections in both English and Latin, both written in slightly different scripts, Though who this was is a mystery, whether he wrote it or owned it, we don't know. Given the wealth of erotic binding magic and theft detection magic in the text, it's a pretty good guess that the writer and practitioner of the volume was someone with some clerical necromantic training who's using those professional skills much more like the cunning people of the period. So a curious possibility is that the text may have been composed and used by a dislocated friar or monk who, in the need of a couple quid, has produced this volume to both look magical and perform necromantic feats that were meant to supplement or even generate the entirety of their income. This may be the work of a professional necromancer. I mean, can you imagine their LinkedIn profile? The text contains 91 various experimenta, the typical Latin word for magical spells in the Middle Ages, a substantial plurality of which, 31% are erotic binding magic, while 23% are divinatory in nature, with the rest being a smattering of a wide range of magical practices from creating magical monsters, medical magic, theft detection, herbal magic, etc. Further, the complexity of the magical experiments ranges substantially. Despite this, the text is somewhat systematic in construction. The first section functions as a kind of introduction to necromantic practice generally, how to achieve certain kinds of ingredients like bat blood. 
the consecration of magical circles, various kinds of characters, and the consecration of parchment. The end of the text also includes discussions for how to consecrate and produce quills for writing, needles, ironwork, linens, magical wands, and swords as well. Sandwiched between these preparatory instructions is a substantial range of magical experiments. Everything from summoning and inquiring about spirits to changing the color of money. There are three spells, at least, for getting women to lift their legs up high while dancing. Like a 16th century can-can or something. How to produce a never-ending supply of money, a secret seal of Solomon, of course. How to cure toothaches, magically emancipating yourself from prison, conjuring and even marrying Valerian root, but... Sadly, tragically, all the spells for finding buried treasure have actually been torn out of this manuscript. Devastating. Interestingly, there are no spells for raising the dead and only one spell for actually bringing harm to others, the so-called Vengeance of Troy spell known from other magical texts as well. It's really a necromantic textbook and recipe book all in one. And to get a better feel of some of these experimenta or magical spells, let's take a look at them in a little bit more detail. So say you want to have women dance naked in your house for some reason. Yep, that's the spell here. So you take your bat blood, described early on in the manuscript, and you write the names of the spirits Ha, Amalba, and Radhanasta on virgin parchment, and you bury it beneath the threshold of a house, or you stick it in the hinges. Done. They're going to be dancing naked in no time. It's not really clear how to get guys to dance naked in your house, because that's probably a thing too. But there are at least three other spells having to do with women dancing in a house, all performed by writing spirit names on virgin parchment with bat's blood. Also, this is the part of the episode where I insist that no one try any of this, especially anything that brings harm to any sentient beings, whether they be bats or moles or other human beings. Now, if you want an infinite supply of money, one needs to take mole's blood, which is dipped onto a penny several times, and then hide that in a church, such that nine masses will be said over that penny, which, when put into a mole skin or bear skin purse, will somehow reappear into the purse, even if the money's spent. It's a game genie code for infinite money. Several of the divination spells typically involve employing a child prior to the age of puberty and born into wedlock. Employing's a strong word here, I'm sure they weren't paid. Such that a spirit can be summoned to appear in the polished and anointed thumbnail of the child. This form of divination is widely attested in the Middle Ages, and even the philosopher John of Salisbury testified that he was made to engage in such a practice as a child. Here the conjuration is very complex, involving spoken components in both Latin and English. The child's invocation is in English primarily, I guess they haven't learned Latin yet, such that the child can peer into the anointed and polished thumbnail and act as a kind of go-between for the conjured spirit. A certain spirit called Only is very popular here, and the necromancer are doing the conjuring. There are even specifications for using the right or left thumb depending on the gender of the child and prolonged conjurations based on exorcistic rituals common at the time. Indeed, much of the ritual here leans heavily on the sayings of the mass or exorcistic procedures of that time period more specifically. Another spell that we find is the so-called Vengeance of Troy, a widely attested spell of antisocial magic in which a partially clay, partially waxen image of the victim, written upon with various names of various spirits, is produced such that the harm caused to the image will be transferred to the actual person. In fact, two versions of this spell are provided which elaborate further on this form of magical torture, basically. 
A very similar version of this spell is attested in other magical texts, most famously in A Discovery of Witchcraft, and takes its name from the Aeneid where Troy, the victim in the Trojan War, gains vengeance through the rise of the Roman Empire. One of the most elaborate spells of herbal magic involves banishing spirits and then conjuring and marrying valerian root. Yes, you literally put a ring on it and perform a kind of ritual marriage to the plant which, in turn, is used as a part of a very elaborate erotic binding spell. Again, we say erotic binding spell and not love magic because love typically involves at least some degree of consent and erotic binding magic doesn't, which again, don't try this at home, erotic binding magic probably isn't ethical. Another spell involves the famed Seal of Solomon, which can be used to trap demons, along with other such seals which perform a wide range of magical roles, including, of course, binding spirits, or even allowing you to escape from prison. Something that might come in handy for a would-be necromancer engaged in the felonious practice of medieval magic. Of course, there are several spells for summoning specific spirits along with their seals, and the seals for the various days of the week, and the planets for astral magic found in many such manuscripts, though differing substantially from manuscript to manuscript. A particularly gruesome spell involves killing a hoopy and then producing maggots from its blood, which eventually becomes a fly. The spontaneous production of flies from corpses was an idea until the 17th century, which in turn is mixed with various kinds of things to produce a magical bird, which is then killed again, roasted such that the fat of the artificial magical bird is rendered into a lotion, which when applied to the eyes, allows one to see various spirits and demons, but also inquire of them whatever questions you may have, along with further spells which can undo this whole business of you seeing spirits all the time, which would be inconvenient. Further spells can be found for everything from winning at dice, to getting a good night's sleep, to summoning three magical knights and conjuring the spirit Bleth, who you may know as Belet in the Solomonic tradition, for instance, they're found in the Lesser Key of Solomon as well. Generally speaking, the text can be further subdivided into four subsections. Necromantic magic involving summoning various good and evil spirits. Natural magic involving the manipulation of hidden or occult qualities of plants and animals. Natural magic more specifically involving herbalism. And astrological image magic in the tradition of Alkindis on the Stellar Rays. Though, as we've seen, there is a substantial range of spellcraft Though, while some do stand out, the text is quite similar to other necromantic volumes which have survived from the Middle Ages and the early modern period. What's a really fascinating line of study is comparing and contrasting and trying to date these to see how this form of magic or magics actually spread through Europe in the early to the late Middle Ages. Overall, additional 3544 is a nuanced and interesting historical textbook and experimental recipe book of necromancy from a decisive period of British history. Thus, it's important not only for its value in the history of magic, but also how magic itself was beginning to shift and change in this time period given other larger tectonic shifts at the religious and cultural level. It's also interesting in that it represents a form of largely non-Salomonic ritual magic in the Middle Ages, but its interest in scrying also prefigures a great deal of the methodology of more famous sessions, for instance those of Dr. John Dee and Edward Kelly. Further, the text exists right at the edge of the period in which saw the publication of Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy in 1533, and other texts of Renaissance theurgical magic and Kabbalah. So it's a later survival of medieval magic, but on the cusp of a significant transition of magical practice starting in the latter half of the 16th century and beyond. The wonderful edition produced by Francis Young is very much worth getting for anyone interested in the history and practice of magic, or necromancy more specifically. 
The introduction is very solid as well are the notes. He reproduces both the Latin and early modern English along with translations of both along with filling out the very complicated often Latin abbreviations. The magical diagrams of the text however are also reproduced but they can be difficult to read in his volume. However, Jung makes it clear that his focus is the text itself and not the magical devices. I believe that the entire text has been digitized, but at the time of writing this episode, the website for the Cambridge Library doesn't seem to be working for me. I'll blame evil spirits. Of course, if you're interested in the history of magic, the Penn State series is the most outstanding, though the articles can be rather specialized, and you can also consult the monumental collection of the works of Thorndike. Further, another classic necromancer's manual can be found in that series, the Penn series, published as Forbidden Rites. That's the Munich necromancer's manual if you want to consult it. Comparing and contrasting these texts, as I mentioned earlier, is a very interesting exercise, both historically and academically. I look forward to the further publication of such documents in the history of magic. They give us such a unique window onto the practice of not just the occult, but also religious observance at this time more generally. Again, it's worth driving this point home. This magic, all of this necromancy, only works, and so far as it works, because of the operative power of Christianity on the part of the believer. The writer and practitioner of this text, and basically all of these texts, was just as much a Christian as they were a magician, conjurer, or necromancer. Thus, again, disrupting what may strike us as a complete contradiction lived side by side in Tudor England or medieval Munich. One wonders what seeming contradictions, religious or cultural or otherwise, the future will see us bearing. Make sure to subscribe and check out my other content and topics on the occult and esotericism, and again, perhaps you consider supporting my work of producing this kind of content on the occult and esotericism for free here on YouTube by taking a look at my Patreon or perhaps a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and I really appreciate you making the consideration. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.